Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're continuing just reviewing Daniel chapter 11, verse 30 to 45 with the uh, historical applications of got to go through 40 to 45 a little bit more. And then I'm going to try to figure out how we're going to draw this on a line. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, thank you for this morning and for uh, your presence that is always with us and that uh, we can come together and seek your face and that we can know that you are here teaching us through your spirit. We know, Lord, that um, we've been struggling through these passages and relating them to the past and also to the present. And we see, Lord, our need of you uh, to understand your word and to live a Christian life. So we invite your presence into our hearts, into our minds, and into this study. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, yesterday we finished off with a comment from Stephen where we had this number uh, but it was was wasn't quite correct in that we had it inverted. That is, um, if we take one four four and we square it, we get two zero seven three six, and we were relating that to this number uh, two zero seven six or yeah two seven six three, and that was where was that two seven six three? Where was the word? I think it was like wickedness. No, it wasn't wickedness because that was, oh, there it is. Uh, utterly make away 2763. Now, we do know that numbers don't have to be in the same order to be a symbol. And, and we notice that with, um, with the word wickedness. And that was back here somewhere. It's footnote number 30. We'll go back here. Such as do wickedly. Okay. So, so I noted this number that 7561 is similar to 7651 as far as the numbers. Obviously, there's no relationship of these numbers between the meanings of the Hebrew words. These are just simply of the new numerical order in Strong's dictionary. So it's basically just matching alphabet as he places the words alphabetically in Hebrew. He numbers them. Uh, so that we can cross-reference them more easily if we don't know how to read Hebrew. We can just compare these words this way. And um, I remember before we had computers, I mean, I had a Strong's Concordance, and, uh, you know, you'd look up a word, and it would tell you the number of it so that you could look it up in a dictionary. So it would tell you the different verses, and it'd get this sort of little cross-reference. It'd have, like, just part of the sentence of that verse. Um, so you can see a bit of the context, and then we could go to that verse. So you could basically look look up like we do here with eSword, which is much faster. So it used to take a lot of time studying. The thing I liked about the old way of study is that it gave me a lot of time to process as I was doing word searches and comparing Scripture with Scripture. So some people would say, well, it's faster now. And it's true, there are some things we can do faster. But we still think at the same speed. So just because we can look up words faster doesn't mean our, our studying is ultimately faster. As you can see by these studies here, how slowly we go through Daniel chapter 11. I mean, it probably saves us a bit of time, but I'm not sure how much. But it, it does give us access to some things that would take a very long time to access. Um, so it's really nice to have these tools at the present time. But anyway, we have this, this word 7561. We know 7651 is the word seven, right? So there's no problem with the fact that even though Stephen got these numbers ordered around, I'm not the only one who gets his numbers mixed up, that we could take that seven or two seven six three and we could see that it relates to the 144,000. And that word was there to utterly make away many. And we're saying that this is in the context of the prohibition to buy and sell for Sabbath keepers. The word that it's related to, that we say it, it relate, relates to a symbol of the 144,000. And so 
this would uh, be the context in which this this symbol would be applied. And um, we're just going to we're just going to go through this. So there's a couple of things I, I noted as I was going through it on my own that I want to just discuss. So. So we know at the time of the end. Right. So the time of the end is referenced in other verses in Daniel chapter 11 and also Daniel chapter eight. So we've got this time of the end and we know that it's connected to the time appointed. Right. So you got the time of the end and the time appointed. And so here in verse 40, we know that the time of the end there is 1798. And uh, it's a and, and remember here, even with this word time, it is a symbol of 360, which is the principle upon which we use uh, the day year principle, 360 uh, days in a prophetic year. And we know six times two times five times six is 360. And um, then we have the word kets, which is the word end. So at the time of the end. 1798, shall the king of the south. So we know that the king of the south here is France, and we had some discussion. So we know there are many people who try to say the king of the south is Egypt, and the king of the north is Turkey, and it's Egypt and Turkey coming against France, because France is, according to Uri Smith and Alexander Keith and Josiah Litch, is the power that's um, talked about in verse uh, 36. And to 39, which we know is actually not France. France is the king of the south here. And the king of the north is the papacy at this time. So in 1798, of course, the United States is going to rise. It's going to be the days of one king. And so when it says the king of the north uh, shall come against him, the king of the north here is the papacy along with the United States coming against the Soviet Union in this case, not France. And that is because the characteristics that France had in 1798, in 1989, those characteristics have moved to the USSR. It's this atheistic communism. And we looked at the Newsweek. We didn't read the article, but we know it's the Newsweek article from December 25th, 1989, called the Days of the Whirlwind, and they're going to go through just the different dates that happened in 1989 and before that that led to uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, of course, uh, they're publishing in Newsweek on December 25th, 1989, so they don't know that the Soviet Union is going to fall uh, two years to the day later, so they don't have that information when they make that publication. So it, it's addressing specifically what happens in 1989, not what happens in 1991. Now, we have some some things here that we have to consider. So when it says uh, he comes against them with chariots, with horsemen, we look at the chariots and the horsemen as American military pressure. Star Wars the, uh, was part of that pressure. That was... Uh, Supposed to be some kind of uh, system to shoot down missiles that Americans were to employ in in space, which they actually never had that ability, but they made the Russians think that they did. And then with many ships. So this is going to be the economic pressure that was placed upon uh, the Soviet Union by the Americans. And then he shall enter into the countries. So these, so we're taking countries here to refer to the former Soviet bloc nations, and shall overflow. Now, overflow and pass over, we generally apply to the Sunday law. But here we're applying it to December 25th, 1991. And why can we do that? Because we didn't have a Sunday law on December 25th, 1991. But why can we, why can we apply these symbols, overflow and pass over, to that date? Nobody wants to answer that question? I'm sure somebody knows the answer. So in our 777 line that ended December 25th, 2021, we had December 25th marked as the Sunday law. Now, we should be able to understand just even the basic symbol of the Sunday law attached to December 25th. You know, even though a lot of stuff in um, Alexander Hislop's book, uh, The Two Babylons, is 
complete misinformation. It's wrong information. It's you know, lots of mistakes in it. But we can still understand that 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 Christmas, December 25th, is a symbol that relates to sun worship. Can we agree to that? Yes. Yes, we can. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So even though you know Hislip is one of the books we rely upon, a lot of the stuff is just completely wrong. But we can still understand as a symbol, December 25th is attached to sun worship, so we can agree on that. And we can also see that um, we had it as a symbol of the Sunday law in our 777 structure. And December 25th, 1991 is the 777th day from November 9th, 2000 or 1989. So they have a 777 structure in there as well. And so we can see that it symbolizes that. That is what happens with the fall of the Soviet Union in that line is typical. And we also have December 25th, other places, obviously, in 508, baptism of Clovis. And, and we got Charlemagne and we got a bunch of other ones that I can't think of at the moment, but lots of different December 25th. The uh, uh, we, Sol Invictus. Yeah, the Sol Invictus thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's just lots of lots of symbols about December 25th that we can then say this overflow and pass over. It is talking about the Sunday law, but it's talking about it here in a typical sense if we're going to apply it to the fall of the Soviet Union on December 25th, 1991. Now, we can say, you know, that the United States conquering the Soviet Union typifies the Sunday law. And and the reason we can say that is it's a way mark in a line and every way mark typifies every other way mark. So we could probably take this verse and have this verse represent an entire line, right? It's got a time at the end. It's got the Sunday law, right? So it, you know, you, you could just take this verse and it is a line. You don't need the other verses to have a line, but that's just because it's representing uh, a way mark, the time at the end way mark and the Sunday law way mark and the events in between it. So, so it is a line. Right. So we, we have to always understand this about the lines. And this is one of the real problems that I see presently in the movement is that not only we have, you know, we don't understand the lines that was we and, and we've abandoned the lines. And the reason why they're abandoned, I think, to a large degree is because they weren't understood that, you know, we had all these different way marks, you know, that we would mark as midnight or midnight cry or time of the end or whatever. And um, they just seem to be confusion to people. But once we understood the principle of how to look at a line, and people will ask me sometimes, you know, about a date, and they'll say, you know, something in, in our history, and this, you know, is this, you know, how do we label this this way mark? Well, it depends what line you're looking at, you know, because you can, for instance, label July 18th as the time of the end. You can mark it as the first disappointment if you're in a certain line. But you you can't say that it's, you know, it, it's only the parallels uh, the great disappointment because it parallels Samuel Snow's letters, July 18th. So anyway, we know that we can create a line with this verse. It has the Sunday law in it because all way marks contain those those things but it has very powerful symbols here so when we're applying this as we do we know that that represents the the sunday law but now we look at the next verse so rome is going to enter into the glorious land which we have as the usa so in in this history because we're at the time of the end at the, at the end of the world and the jewish nation is no longer god's people god's denominated people and the land of Israel is no more the glorious land. That's that's moved to the United States. This is talking about the United States. Now, the problem that I would have with people who try to say, well, the king of the north is in this history, uh, Turkey, and the king of the south is Egypt. You would then have to take the position that the glorious land is the land of Israel. Right. Which, of course, people are going to do. And we know that we can't do that. Right? The glorious land cannot be the land of Israel. 
I mean, Ellen White just is so clear about that, um, that it's the United States. So and this was a big issue that Jeff had to deal with back in the 90s. So this, this was something that um, he was he was understanding that, you know, the glorious land is is the United States. And and, and I believe that's actually how he had his attention drawn to Hiram Edson's article on the times of the Gentiles, which addresses the 2520, because I believe it's in those series of articles where Hiram Edson is going to talk about the United States being the glorious land. If I remember correctly, you know, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that's how he ended up looking at those articles in the first place. So we also know that uh, Papal Rome has to conquer these three geographical locations, right? So it's um, it's going to conquer uh, the Soviet Union. Now, um, how do we characterize these then? So we know that Egypt represents the world. Uh, the United States, that's represented by the glorious land. So the conquering of the Soviet Union is what? How do we characterize that again? Because that's going to be the first geographical location, right? Well, that's the king of the south. Okay. So it's, it's the king of the south. So, so when we look at pagan Rome, what is the three geographical locations that it conquers? Uh, Syria, Judea. Yeah. And then Egypt. So there, Syria is the king of the north, right? And Egypt is the king of the south. So just to try to, to understand this, so we know that the Soviet Union is not Egypt. But in, in the other, in the time of pagan Rome, the king of the south is, is Egypt. The king of the north is Syria. And, and then you have, of course, uh, the land of Judea. Those are conquered by, by pagan Rome. So now here we're going to have the king of the south and Egypt. And, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble sort of trying to say, why are those two separate? What we normally have when we look at, at the book of Revelation, we deal with uh, Babylon. It's divided into three parts, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Of course, you know, the dragon power is the world. It's the UN, you know, it's symbolized by Greece and Egypt and all those things. Um, the United States is you know the glorious land and um and then we have the papacy itself so so the question that i have is is what's the difference between the the conquering of the soviet union which here is the king of the south and the conquering of egypt because one of the things we do believe is that the characteristic that that rome or that rome had, that um the Soviet Union had that made it the king of the south, its atheism and its uh, um, licentiousness, right? So it's Sodom and Egypt. And it has this, so it has this characteristic that it inherited from France. So now France, you know, is the king of the south. So that's why you know, the USSR is the king of the south. But that characteristic is going to move from the Soviet Union to the UN. So the UN becomes this, in a sense, Egypt. And there isn't a lot of difference between the king of the south and Egypt. Right. So that's, that's all I'm trying to say. So it's going to conquer the Soviet Union, but that characteristic is going to pass to the UN. The UN is the dragon power. So how do we understand that? Is there any way that we could explain that? Yeah, I just listened to Jeff's presentation there this morning from okay. Sabbath. Okay. So his his understanding is Russia is still the king of the south, and mm -hmm. that it only went up to the neck when it overflowed in Passover, tying it in uh, with uh, Isaiah chapter eight, verse eight, mm -hmm. and. Uh, He's relating to this here, a victory for Russia over Ukraine would be Rafia. Yeah, but we know that yeah. can't be correct. So that can't possibly be correct. I, I know, I know what Jeff thinks, right? So mm -hmm. could you think that's correct? That we can just do that? Cause I, I don't think that the war between Russia and Ukraine is part of this prophecy. 
Mm -hmm. To me, it'd be the same error as trying to apply the king of the north uh, to Turkey, you know, in 1798. Mm -hmm. Just making that same error that that he criticized other people as of making. Well, in in the sense that Russia would be the head. But but it's not the head. In the sense. But that's what he says. But it can't be the head because the head is the thing that characterizes, you know, in a sense, you could say the head passed from France to the Soviet Union. So, yeah, he tries to take the head to be to be Moscow. Right. Or at least Russia. Yeah, well, but in, in initially he was talking about Moscow, right? So Moscow ends up being the head because it's the capital, right? Yes. Um, so going back to Isaiah chapter 7 as well. Now, the problem there is that the Soviet Union is not an atheistic country, or that Russia is not an atheistic country. Soviet Union was, Russia is not. It doesn't have the characteristics that would make it the king of the south those characteristics have passed over to the un so so they have conquered the soviet union so we can say that that's the king of the south right so they had to conquer that but then we're saying well they conquered it but we also have the un and it's it's the same symbol here it's it's egypt and egypt is the king of the south so so we have to be you know we have to be clear on this you know and how we're understanding this so the head, you're saying, going up to the, the neck mm-hmm. is sort of leaving. Or has, was there, would there not be like a capital involved in some way? So it, there doesn't have to be a capital involved. That That's the way that Jeff looked at it, because he was going back to, you know, the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is, you know, uh, resin, right, or reason. So the head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is reason. Yeah, that's how it goes. And so he was using that idea and saying, well, you know, it's 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 going to be the capital. So so Moscow. But but the thing is, the head is more the philosophy or the idea, right? Because obviously we know that you know it, it can't be like the president of the USSR or, or anything like that. So so we're looking at something that's typical of it. That's that that the main thing he's applying there is that civil war that's occurring. And so you're going to have northern Israel and southern Israel, Judah and Ephraim, you know, fighting in a civil war. And Ephraim is going to be aligned with 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 um, uh, Syria. Right. With Aram. So that's going to be used as a type. So we can look at chapter eight there and we can say, well, what is actually happening in chapter eight? How does that typify? And we know part of it is it actually addresses the Sunday law symbolism as well. But we can take that battle and we can look at it in the context of what happened in 1989. And we can say, well, it comes up to the neck. So even though you destroy the Soviet Union, you didn't destroy the thing that you were seeking to destroy. That is atheistic communism. Atheistic communism is alive and well, but not in Moscow not in Russia. So that characteristic of the king of the south, it moves over to the UN, which is Egypt. Any more thoughts on that, Stephen? I don't know if you agree with me or think I'm out to lunch. No. Yeah, I- yeah I'm just kind of uh, exploring again the potential mm-hmm. to understand. Yeah. I- yeah, I understand. Yeah. So so it's so we still have this problem though of the fact that the king of the south is Egypt in all of the rest of the book of Daniel, and now we have the king of the south being the Soviet Union. It's it has that characteristic attached attached to it. It's Sodom and Egypt. So that means that in 1989, when it's conquered, it's not completely conquered because it, it just goes up. Up to the neck. And if we look at those verses, so let, let's go to Isaiah chapter eight. Well, actually, I'll go to chapter seven first because chapter eight's in the context of chapter seven. So we know we have this civil war going on, right? So it's a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. And the king of the north here is going to be aligned 
with Syria. So what history is this typifying, right? Com Syria's confederate with Ephraim. Yeah, so uh, 1863. Okay, so, so we say it represents 1863. That's because this is connected with, like, this is 742. This is the beginning of the prophetic mirror. And it's going to be a mirror of what happens in the Civil War in the United States. So in the Civil War of the United States, who's the king of the North and who's the king of the South? Or who's the South and who's the North? I mean, it's, it's kind of a weird question because we know the North is the North and the South is the South. But we attach something else to them. We would say that the North is Republican and the South is Democrat, correct? Like we can yeah, say it's a civil been applied. Yeah, so we can say it's a civil war in the United States and there's a North and a South, but there's also something else that's attached to it, and that is these political parties. So we look at the civil war in our history and we see a battle between the king of the North and the king of the South, between uh, the Republicans and the Democrats. That's going on in the United States today. And so we've connected what happened in 742 BC to what happened in the American Civil War. And we've applied it to our time with the Civil War that's going on presently. When we had what happened on January 6th, uh, 2021, with the siege of Washington, we, we can look at that as the defeat of the king of the north by the king of the south. Republicans are going to be defeated by Democrats. And and that becomes raffia, right, as a symbol. Right? We're not saying that that's raffia because on the big line. So you're saying that Jeff is trying to attach raffia to Russia defeating the Ukraine. That's how I understood. So that means the Ukraine is the king of the north and russia is the king of the south in this context no, no he doesn't make out parallel okay so he doesn't have like a proxy so so you have so the the proxy like a proxy. Between, between the united states and russia so he's saying that if the ukraine is defeated russia is defeated or, or united states is defeated i mean yes okay i don't know to me that would seem like the same species of error that we have in trying to to apply apply it the way Uriah Smith does to that to those verses, so I, I don't think that you can do that. I don't think you can say that if if Ukraine loses, the United States lost. Especially because I know quite a bit about what's actually happening in with uh, Russia and the Ukraine. Yeah. Well, just with the with the battle itself, it's uh, already you see. Sort of bringing down of the United States in the sense it's a lot of it's self inflicted mm -hmm. with the with the money they're just throwing away mm -hmm. uh, with the, the blowing up the Nord Stream the gas line that's affecting Germany and mm -hmm. other countries as well so yeah it's so just it, maybe just part of, so it's like yeah, almost it, by design they're, they're designing to bring down themselves and this Ukraine wars that, like an excuse? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, there are some things about the war that we could look at and apply typically, like any history. But to put it as raffia, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I, I don't even know what line that would be in. Right? You, you see the problem there. You know, I was going over Jeff's papers, you know, and, and, and I hate talking about this topic, but, you know, I just can't, you know, especially like his his recent papers, like the ones over the last few days, looking at them. And there's just no logic in anything. And a lot of rhetoric, a lot of sort of, a lot of language, uh, much more than Jeff ever used. But it doesn't really have any substance. There isn't a logical thread tying things together. It's kind of jumping around. That's my perspective. And this would be this type of thing, like to try to talk about, you know, United States losing this proxy war to the United to to the Soviet Union or to Russia. I mean, there's so many other things going on that really have. I mean, one is the United States hasn't been defeated yet. I mean, they haven't fallen yet. 
I, I mean, I think the real issue that's going to happen is the civil war in the United States over this next election. And that's going to be a major issue. But I don't know how much the Ukrainian war really is affecting the United States. I mean, yeah, it's affecting their economy a bit. Um, but there's so many other factors affecting the American economy. There's nothing to do with the war in the Ukraine. I don't know. I just, I don't see how it could be raffia. But anyway, let's, let's look at these verses here. So we have a civil war and there's, there's going to be this little puzzle or whatever you want to call it in verse eight and nine or verse eight to nine. Thus saith the Lord God, I shall, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. Um, verse seven. And for the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken that it be not a people. So the head that the word Rosh, right? So that's the capital of Syria is Damascus. And the capital of Damascus is reason, right? So obviously he's the king. He's the head. And then we have the same thing with Ephraim. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. That's the capital city. And the head of Samaria is Ramalai's son, which is Pekka. So we have this symbol here. Now, when we get to chapter 8, it's going to talk about the Assyrian invasion. So we know that in verse 6, it says, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh, that go softly, and rejoice in reason and Remali's sons, so reason and Pekka. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. Now, so the one that comes in that overflows and passes over in this case is Assyria. And Assyria is the king of the north, right? He shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Right. So we, we take that verse 8, 8, which is an important verse, and it's representing the Sunday law. Right. W would we say it's representing the Sunday law? This is overflowing and going over or passing over. It would look like it. OK. So so we know that there is a symbol there that relates to the Sunday law. And and what's going to happen, of course, is Assyria is going to, um, you know, conquer northern Israel. And Assyria is also going to come against Judah. But Judah's king is not going to be, you know, the, the kingship is not going to be put to an end. Manasseh is going to be taken captive. Right. Carried to Babylon by the king of Assyria. He's going to still maintain his kingship. He's going to be after he does some slave labor. Now, this, of course, is addressing more specifically the immediate history that's going to happen. So we know in the time of um, Hezekiah that we're going to have to deal with this history. So during the time of Hezekiah, you're going to have Assyria come in and they're going to, you know, destroy Samaria. and um, and then you're going to have, you know, Hezekiah himself be in subjection to Assyria. But, you know, it's not he's not going to the Syrians are not going to destroy Jerusalem or, or end the kingship. So we have to figure, OK, well, what is that? What is that addressing? So this is the Sunday law. You can see that Protestantism, which can be represented by northern Israel, is going to be overcome by the Sunday law. And God's people, which represents Judah, Jerusalem, they're going to be affected, but they're going to also, in a sense, be delivered, right? That is, some things are going to be destroyed, but they will survive. So if we're going to try to apply this to the Soviet Union in 1989, I mean, we can, in, in sort of a, a typical way, we can see that there are characteristics here that are similar. But you can't just directly take this and say, this is like the king of the north here is Assyria, right? Assyria is going to come against Israel and Judah. 
these two powers that are the northern and the southern tribes, and it's going to destroy the northern tribe, uh, but it's not going to destroy the south, right? The northern tribes, you know, Ephraim, but it's not going to destroy Judah. So there are things you can take from this story as a symbol, but this is much more in relation to the civil war in the United States if we're going to make a direct application of it. Does that make sense? It would seem to. Yeah. So the problem that I have is we can't just pick and choose. We can't just take parts of things. We need to have very clear lines when we're looking at a history and we're making an application. We can't just pick some things and apply them because there's there's no there's no rule to it. Right. It's like you can you can pick and choose things all throughout scripture and build these prophetic models. But if you're not putting things line upon line, if you don't have clearly defined lines and know what it is you're you're addressing, how you're making that application of those passages, then you can do anything you want with scripture. So so I think we just have to be be a lot more careful, like how we went through judges was very, very powerful in understanding how the lines work, that we we could apply those histories, but they're def- they're defined in a line. And we would have all kinds of witnesses that would show that we've done the same thing in Daniel chapter 11. We can take the kings of Persia and we can put them in a line. And when we do that, some on a superficial level, if you just did it, you can you can draw wrong conclusions. You, you can say that um, Alexander the Great represents Donald Trump, which he can't. Right. If you put it on a line, he can't. So at least in that line. Right. I mean, maybe there's aspects of Alexander the Great that you could find a line that you could put Donald Trump on. But then you can't mix those lines up and just create whatever history you want. So um, so that would be the problem that I have with this. So we know that this is a symbol of the Sunday law and we can see that what happened in this history is typical of the Sunday law just in and of itself. And we see this again and again in in Isaiah, right? We're going to have the same thing here where it's going to talk about um, uh, in Isaiah 28, talking about the covenant with death, right? And the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies a refuge and under falsehoods have we hid ourselves. So we can see that this is a type of the Sunday law. But in this context, we have verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So we know in the context of line upon line, we have a line of judgment and we have way marks of righteousness. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. And the overflowing scourge shall pass through. Then ye shall be trodden down uh, by it. So I I think we have to keep that, that that these histories, you know, what's going to happen to Jerusalem, um, you know, with the destruction of Jerusalem, you know, in 586. I mean, that's the type of the Sunday law, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's the type of the Sunday law. So we have lots of types of Sunday laws. And when we put things on a line, we can see how they line up. We can see that Sunday laws have existed in our history. We're in the time of the Sunday law. I mean, we could say ever since 9-11, but even even 1989 has aspects of the Sunday law in it. Right. It's typifying the Sunday law. So when we deal with this in Daniel chapter 11, so we we start addressing uh, these verses, what happens in 1989, and we see, okay, we have the king of the south, 1798, he's going to push at the king of the north, right? So the Pope's taken captive. The United States at that time arises, it's the two-horned beast, right? And so when it says the king of the north shall come against them like the whirlwind, we know the king of the north here in this context is the papacy. 
but he's going to come with the United States, the chariots, the horsemen, the many ships. So, you know, technically the papacy is the king of the north, but the United States is also part of the king of the north because it's the military and economic uh, power that's used here to overthrow the king of the south. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So we know that that, that is typifying what's going to happen in the Sunday law. Now, then it says he shall enter also into the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. So we know that this is the Sunday law in the United States, right? When he enters into the glorious land, that's that has to be the Sunday law in the United States. It can't be before that. Now, the Sunday law is progressive, but so he's going to enter into the glorious land. So that's another geographical obstacle that he has to conquer. And then um, he's going to uh, stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall, shall not escape. So we know Egypt typically is seen as the king of the south. But here, Egypt represents the UN. The UN. Okay. Then then says, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold, silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. Right? So Egypt is, you know, way in the north of Africa. And then it says the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be in his steps. So the Libyans are the poor, the Ethiopians, Ethiopians are the rich, and be at his steps. So that means the rich and the poor alike will buy into, even though the poor don't know how much money, they're going to buy into this Sunday law. And then we have tidings out of the east and the north. So we know that the east represents Christ's second coming, and the north represents, what does the north represent? Christ is the king of the north. The true king of the north. So what is it representing? A sad note, uh, behold the bridegroom cross. Yeah, right. So so we're going to have, yeah, so behold the bridegroom cometh is the east, and the north is Babylon is fallen is fallen, right? So we have these two messages. The message of the second coming, behold the bridegroom cometh, and the message of Babylon is fallen. Because Babylon is the north, Christ is the true king of the north, so that message of the true king of the north is a message of the fall of Babylon. So that, so this is the message that's going to be proclaimed. This is the loud cry. Uh, and therefore he shall go forth with great fury and to utterly make away many. So we're, we're still uh, attributing that to the papacy. And the papacy is going to plant his tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him, right? So this is the end of the papacy. And then it's going to, in chapter 12, verse 1, it's going to talk about the close of probation in that history and the time of trouble that follows. And then it's going to go back and talk about the, the prophecy of Daniel, seeing up the woods, all those types of things. So, so really, it, it brings us to the close of probation and the events that are going to happen afterwards. Now, there's a couple other things. So, yeah, so we have, uh, when we look at verse 44 and 45 in our uh, document, we have that written in there. There was one other point that I think I wanted to look at. Okay, um, we'll just read through this. But tidings, so just what we had read. Loud cry of the third angel, the everlasting gospel is joined, right, by these messages out of the east. Behold, the bridegroom cometh and out of the north. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And these are going to trouble fear. Uh, he's going to be fearful and frightened. That is the papacy. Therefore, papal Rome shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. And so we had looked at that make away and we'd seen this 2763 and we can see it relates um, to 20736, 144,000 squared, right? Um, and then uh, many, so she take away many. So this is referring to the prohibition to buy and sell for Sabbath keepers. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and I don't know why I got those there. 
So C's M. Now I, I want to deal with this word between, so I'm going to cross it out, or or maybe that's the correct one. Yeah, because what does it say? It says um, in the King James, it says. Let me see here. I got I got I got to remember how this goes. Yeah, between the seas. Oh, that's right. Between is correct. I'm I'm doing this wrong. It's between the seas. It in is the wrong word. There it is. So they have um, King James between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. And and I'll show you this. So I'm going to go to the Bible program. So we know it's not between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. It's between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Correct? Because if it was in, you would have a... Um, so when you look at this word 2022, that's the word har, and, and har means mountain. And if it was in the glorious holy mountain, instead of having this funny looking thing here, I don't know how well you can see that, that's a, that's a lamed, you would have to have a bet. You'd have to have a letter that looks like this one in the word between, the word bien is between, being. And so, so because it has a lamed, Lamed, lamed doesn't mean in. It means to or against. So, so the way that we address this then, if, if we're going to translate it literally, it doesn't really make sense in English. But you, you could translate this between the seas against uh, the glorious ho ho holy mountain. But the idea is that they're between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. So I'm just going to put and in there, even though I'm going to, I'm going to italicize it because it's an and word. But the idea is that this between, and, and why is this important? Who are the seas? It would be the multitudes, people. Yeah, so it's the people, right? Yeah. And and the glorious holy mountain, what is that? Well, that's a church. It represents a church. Okay, so it represents the church. It doesn't represent... Uh, Jerusalem or Mount Zion as a location, right? Yeah, I would agree. So, so this is representing the church, the people of God, the 144,000 and the people, right? So you've got the, the two, the two classes of people, I guess. And the papacy is going to place or plant its tabernacles of his palace between them. So what what is that referring to? Why is the papacy planting the tabernacles of his palace between the people and the 144,000? When is that? What does it mean? Maybe trying to stop the three angels' messages from going. Okay. Now, he's going to be successful in this context, right? Yeah. Now, the planting, the planting of the tabernacles, I mean, it's... It's, you know, it's not language you would generally use. So uh, this word plant is nata, 5193. It means uh, to fasten or plant, either literally or figuratively. Now, one thing, what do we notice about that number, 5193? Notice anything about that number? 391.5. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we can see that that number H, um, 5193 is 391.5. So that's pretty clear. So what's the symbol there? We say that it is Islam will be involved in this too. Okay. Well, yeah, we, we can have in Islam. We also know that there's at the end of the 391 and a half years um, that we have the kingship of Judah, right? We're going to have the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Zedekiah is going to be killed. The temple is going to be destroyed. The city of Jerusalem is destroyed. So we also have that 391 and a half years that, that's attached. So it's not just about Islam. Islam is, is tied to the 391 as well. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, that Islam is attached here. 391.5 is not just about Islam. 
So, but but it's 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 the word plant here is has that symbol 391.5, and then tabernacles the 168. So the 168 represents well one all week, but take us yeah, to seven years. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it represents uh, the number of hours in a week. Okay. Did you not connect it to the Battle of Pydna as well? Yeah, so that we have attached it to the Battle of Pydna. Um, and it's also tabernacles, right? So it has to do with like a house, a tent, an abode. You know, so here they're going to use it uh, as tabernacles. But it's it's just the word like a tent, a, a home. A dwelling, a tabernacle, right? And and the idea of the word is it's clearly conspicuous from a distance. That's where the the idea of the word comes from. Now it comes from the number one six six. And what's one six six represent? Well, it's uh, FFA, FFA backwards in the sense yeah. connected with so the numbers, yeah. Right, and that word means to be clear or to shine. So I, you know, so the reason why they have this this word for that is, you know, you're you're walking and you see a building in the distance, right? So nowadays we wouldn't have that experience as much. We don't live so scattered apart. But if you've ever been like traveling, you know, in the mountains and you're you're cold and and then off in the distance you see, you know, the roof of uh, um, the ranger cabin or something like that. You, you know, it's something that's conspicuous, right? So that's the idea. But it's it's attached to FFA and it's attached to the week. Okay, so we can. But the primary thing there is the 168. So it it represents a home or an abode, a tent. And then we have um, a pavilion. So that word 643 is, um, it's a Persian word. So it's, it's, it's not a Hebrew word. It's a Persian word uh, that uh, Daniel puts in here. Could I bring up something that just came to me and I had talk, talked about it with Colin maybe a year or so ago yeah. about could Rome be planting its new head Quarters when it takes over the U.S. and of course then the whole world with 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 its something off. Could it be setting up its new head, headquarters in Washington D.C.? Then it would be between literal seas, Atlantic, Pacific. I mean, it's speculation, but it could be literal. Well, Eventually. yeah, I, I mean, maybe, but I mean, we we apply it obviously. The literal doesn't matter here because we're talking about symbols, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's definitely not necessary. I don't know either. But I just thought if I were a conquering power, if I if 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 I were the papacy, I would move the Vatican over to the capital of the U.S. My prime target. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I don't think that that's what it's well, talking. We'll about. see. I mean, I sure don't want to see it, but I can think sometimes but, the way the well, it matter. think, mm -hmm. having been raised Catholic and ha having read a lot of their garbage. Yeah, yeah, but you're still going to see you're still going to see the Sunday Law, and God's people still are going to be delivered. Um, I know. You know so uh, it doesn't really matter to me what happens, as far as as long as I'm you know following God. So so okay. it's going to the. So it's going to plant it between the seas and then, and, and I think it's kind of interesting too. So this word, uh, that's translated as, uh, of its, the tabernacle of its palaces. So this word that's translated as palace, 643, it's going to be between the seas. That's, um, that's 3220 and the mountain, right, is going to be 2022. Two, two. That's Har. So you got Yamim, which is seas, and uh, Lahar, which is uh, against the mountain. And then you have uh, Tisbe, 
So that's 6643. And I should make this so you can see this properly. So you can see that there we got this. And, and I just think it's interesting from the Hebrew numbers that this one's 643, that Persian loan word, and glorious, which of course is referring to God's church. You can see that this, these numbers are, this just has an extra six in the front of it. <clears throat> so I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now, holy, you can see that holy is that word kadash or kodesh refers to often uh, the sanctuary. So we can see that this is God's true people. It's not a mikdash, but yet the papacy, he shall come to his end, right? So this is, so the 144,000, they're going to remain faithful to the Sabbath and the papacy will be destroyed at the second coming of Christ and none shall help him. Her own followers will turn on her, cause her eventual collapse. Ruin, maybe. So, so we're going to see all of those things happen. So it's quite, it, there, there's not really a problem here, I don't think, as far as understanding, uh, um, these, these final two verses. The problem that we have is when we address these three graphical locations, we can see that the Soviet Union is conquered. So, but the Soviet Union is the dragon power. But that dragon power is going to move to the UN, which is Egypt, because Egypt is the dragon power. And then you have God's people. So we have here God's people that are not going to be conquered, right? And then you have the United States. It's going to be conquered. So that's, that's Protestantism. So you have the world is conquered. Uh, I just, you know, how do we describe this as three geographical locations? I guess we could say, because normally what you have is uh, the north and the south and the east, right? Or there's different ways in which uh, these kingdoms move. But here in this history, the north and the south kind of, you know, almost seem like mixed up to some degree. But the king of the north is is Christ, the true king of the north. But the king of the north here in this these verses, that's going to be the United States and the papacy. But the papacy in the United States is going to be conquered by the papacy, even though the United States is connected with the papacy in 1989. So it's conquering, the papacy is conquering the world. So it's going to conquer the Soviet Union, it's going to conquer the United States, and it's going to conquer the UN. But it is true that the characteristics of the Soviet Union when it conquers the Soviet Union, the king of the south, those characteristics do move to Egypt, right? Or they move to the UN, to the world. And, and we can also see what's happened in our history. So one of the things we look at, if we're, if we're going to look at Arafia, I mean, we can definitely see that January 6th is the king of the south defeating the king of the north. And that's within the United States. So going back to that other idea that we had dealing with the Democrats and the Republicans, we can apply that to the civil war that's happening in the United States. We can say that that civil war is occurring, but the king of the north is going to conquer the king of the south. That is, that power, what, what whether we call it republicanism or whatever it is, is going to rise into power. and be worse than what we see right now as far as uh, restrictions on freedom of speech and all those other rights. So that the Republicans, which right, right now appear to be the champions of, of the Constitution, are not going to be the champions of the Constitution. Right? We know that. Right. And And it's hard sometimes for people to see that and to feel it. You know, there are people who just... They hate so much that what's happening. You know, it's like, well, you know, bring on, bring on, you know, the Republicans, bring on, you know, we want to be free to do what we want to do. But that freedom is not going to really be there. Well, it'll be there temporarily. And then it'll. Oh, well, from certain things. But uh, yeah. governments have, have so much power over our lives. And they're not going to relinquish that power. 
right? They're not going to just give us all of our freedoms back. We're not going to be free. We, you know, we might be saying, well, the economy is going to do better or something like that. And that's all that matters to me. Well, the economy is not going to do better. Maybe in the short term, maybe. But this world is heading for a major crisis. And I mean, I think the real problems in the United States is going to be no matter who wins the election, it, it, it can't turn out good. And it's not because of, you know, who the leaders are. It's because of, you know, the divided nature of the United States. And, and I, I don't personally understand how people can be sh so short term in their thinking, you know, that you're going to. The Democrats are idiots. I mean, one is if they would have ignored Trump, he would have gone away. Right. All of yeah. these court, all these court cases. Trump was nowhere. He was in nowhere land. Right. And all they needed to do was ignore him. Just make him irrelevant. And he would have disappeared. But in some ways, I think they wanted Trump back. One is, you know, the the the, the media wanted him because he makes the money. But also they they were under a belief that they, he's easily to defeat. He's easy to defeat. But then everything they did is just makes him more and more popular. I don't know. I, I just don't think they're very wise in how they approach this. It's obviously just emotional. It, it's, it's very counterproductive what, what the Democrats have done. And, and it's amazing to me that they still, you know, want Joe Biden to be their uh, president again. I mean, I could, maybe the establishment just, establishment just believes he's somebody they can control. But um, I don't know. I, I, I just don't see any sense right now in the world in how people are thinking. So, so we're not going to have a, no matter who's the president of the United States, the world has gone a direction that is, well, it's, you know, our civilization is coming to an end. And there's not anything you can do to stop it. You know, it had to happen sometime. Okay, so uh, we got this uh, pretty much, I think, I don't see any major problems with what we have here in this historical application. But now we have to go back to this history and we have to be able to draw this on a line, even before we do the present truth application. So if we're going I to... Think, I don't think I've ever seen it drawn on a line. I mean, bits and pieces. Yeah. And, and, and so I've never seen, I didn't have seen a full line, you know, of it. So this is going to be the whole, well, we have a line in a sense. I mean, we do have the 1260 yeah. papacy and you could, you can, right. you know, that could bring us to 1798 because here we're basically starting at 508 and going to 1798, right? For the papacy itself. And then we have that. The days of one king, we have the United States until the Sunday law again. So we kind of have a line, but here in this line, the time of the end is not going to be 1798 in, in the line of the papacy because the time of the end is going to be probably 508. But yeah, it's, you know, so to create this line, um, I'm just going to get to you. We're gonna, we're gonna. That's what we're gonna do this week. We're gonna try to get this more, line. more detail, detail in this line. <laughs> well, and see, the thing about this line is, you you have a broad line, you know, where you can, um, yeah. you know, lay out a bigger, the bigger picture, you know, because we have lot, we have lines within these lines. Yeah, but I, I think we should be able to see uh, where how this this parallels other lines that we have drawn before. Like when we did uh, Pagan Rome, right, we drew out this line, you know, it addressed the 666 years. And so so the line of Papal Rome is is going to go to 1798. So it's it's going to start from the end of this line. I'm just going to duplicate this. I'm, I'm going to just borrow this line, take all this stuff out of here. Eventually, but um, I'll leave the six 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 in there. Huh? No, we're going to take that. Yeah, we're going to take because this is going to be we're going to have twelve sixty here. So, oh, so this yeah. is. Be, um, so this line will be Daniel 
11 verses, um, probably we would just go from 31 to, well, maybe I'll put 30 in there because you're going to have the period of darkness to uh, 40a. Like that would be the first line that I would draw. So Daniel 11, giving us to that period, to the time of the end. So in that line, you know, I'm going to move like 508 over here. And you know, I'll just blow this line and put this up here. So then I'll have, you know, 1798 over here. So we're going to have 1798 as, you know, the third angel arriving in, in this context. Maybe we'll, we'll see. We might actually put October 22nd, 1844 there. I'm not sure yet. Um, cause I haven't, we haven't drawn up the line. Um, but we're going to put, you know, 508 up here at the beginning somewhere. This is going to be. I don't know if you can fit like in between the seas on there. Some, like some. Well, that's going to be, that's later. So that's the repeat of history. So when we get to 1989. So, so we'll see how this goes. I mean, I'm not sure how this line's going to look. Yeah. But, but we should at least have the 1290 in there from 508 to 1798. Mm, yeah. Mm. Whether we put the 1335 in there or however we're going to look at this. I, I would think first we would just address the rise of papal Rome to 1798 as a line. That's the way that I would do it. Doesn't mean that we can't have a bigger line, but at least we need that. And then we have to figure out, you know, obviously we're going to have these main way marks. Um, and we have to say, well, how does the third angel arrive in 1798 if that's the case? What does that mean? So what is what is the messages that are being talked about? Right? So there has to be a message. There has to be a period of darkness. And then there has to be a time of the end after that period of darkness. And then you have to have, you know, what a message is. So what that message would be in the context of papal Rome. So this would be April Rome. That's what we're looking at, that history. And probably, I'm going to get rid of some of these things here. And there are, there are some things that, um, you know, this line is going to contain, obviously, uh, the 1260, because you're going to have here, you know, 508 to 538, somewhere in there. And we have to figure out why why there's this darkness, you know, what what does that mean? Darkness isn't necessarily darkness in the sense of spiritual darkness. It can just be a darkness based upon whatever this line is representing. And so, you know, we're going to be, be obviously um, there would be something that would uh, you know, formalize this. And I'm not saying that any of this is right at this point. <laughs> that we're obviously going to have, you know, first angel being empowered. So we'd have some event that would mark this empowerment of the first angel and some event that is the arrival of the second. So, you know, it is really possible that um, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, you know, the darkness could even be just dealing with uh, Rome falls in what? For what year does it fall? It's the year. Yeah, yeah 476. 76, yeah. Okay, so 476, you know, you could put... Uh, you know, 508 here. Maybe the empowerment is 538. Something like that. Obviously, it's not going to be the Roman Jewish League. So this is the fall of Rome. Maybe that's the arrival of the first message. I don't know. Right. So we're going to have to figure this out. So we're going to have to think about it. We're going to have to look at these verses and see where we can place these verses. And and again, it's a lot of it's going to be the symbols that are there whether it's in the Hebrew numbers, whether it's in the gematria, whether it's in the language of Daniel chapter 11 itself, that, that that language is some way going to, you know, have symbols attached to it that we can attach to different events. And, and I would think that to some degree, our, our understanding of the 1260 years is rather sketchy. Um, at least mine is. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say our understanding is sketchy? Do we know a lot of the dates that are happening in this history? But do you know what happened during the 1260? What way marks we could possibly have that are being marked there? 
What you mean at the beginning or just? Well, not just the, or, the beginning. We kind of know the beginning. It's just like the 1260 years, you know, we get the beginning, we get the end. But there's there's obviously things that are happening during the 1260. We would have to look at things like the Protestant Reformation, um, the persecution that's happening, right? All of those types of things. I don't have dates for a lot of of these things. You know, would you put uh, the Inquisition in there? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, and how do how would we see that in Daniel chapter 11? How much is Daniel chapter 11 showing us? Because we have all of these these terms in Daniel 11. Where, you know, it's going to talk about, um, you know, where they're going to remove the daily, they set up the abomination, they're going to, you know, corrupt by flatteries. You know, you got the Christians that are among them that shall instruct many. Uh, they shall fall by the sword. So there's obviously persecution, people being burned at the stake. There's all kinds of things happening in that history. They go captivity, spoil, right? So we know it's happening during that history, but are there specific events that we can mark? And even the United States, because it says when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. Well, you say that's Revelation 12, 16. I mean, we don't just mark it right at the beginning. There's obviously things that are going to happen during that period where the United States um, begins. People flee from Europe to the U.S. Right. So so a lot of these things, we haven't really attached events to them in a specific way. Be inter- it's interesting to see how it develops. Yeah. So, so it's going to take a bit of time. It's not, it's not going to be very simple because we need to really understand this line. Yeah. Of Papal Rome, what's actually being talked about in Daniel chapter 11. And I don't think that we've, we, we just sort of look at it with a broad brush. We haven't really worked out the details. Not fully, not fully looked at it. Yeah, and, and and we wouldn't say, you know, that it's just in 1798 that, you know, they're at the yeah. United States as the wilderness um, comes into play, right? We're going to say the United States, it's, I mean, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? So, um, so the United States comes as a place of refuge. You also have the, you know, the, the Walden Seas and the Alvagen Seas. There's a lot of history in there of persecution. So we'd have to kind of see what what things are going to symbolize these waymarks. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Um, Stephen? Yeah. Maybe unrelated, but I was just speaking to Julio uh, last night. Okay. And uh, he, was talk- he was talking about the Caesars. The seventh Caesar is called... Galba, and mm. uh, he's he was he was seventy years old when he died, and he reigned seven months and seven years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, or or sorry, no, seven months and seven days. So he's trying to do it like parallel to Trump. Yeah, so there is like a we have that sort of connection. He was seventy years old, seven months and seven days, mm. and. Uh, the actual number of days he lived, if you have an inclusive count, is twenty five twenty times ten plus three nine one. Okay, interesting. Yeah, there's definitely stuff there dealing with Galba. And and I mean we have addressed it a little bit because I do think Odilio studies had some insight into them. And and you know, and he didn't really create that as study originally, right? It came, I think, from blessings um in Africa. And and so he looked at it again, and we looked at it a bit. There's definitely lots of symbolism in, in there um, dealing with our history, and and that's an interesting history. I mean, I wouldn't mind having uh, Odilia do some presentations again uh, on on some of this stuff. Okay, thanks. Let's let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love for the study this uh, morning and we just pray for your presence throughout this day may your angels watch over each person and may your holy spirit speak to those who are searching for truth help us as we think about these things throughout the day and that your holy spirit can uh, teach us and we pray for those such as odilio um, and others who are studying 
and that you are giving light to. We just pray, Lord, that, that we can all be faithful to you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.